Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to publish a high quality website or blog. For a free 14 day trial, go to Squarespace.com slash frame rate. And by Hover.com. Hover is domain name registration and management that's simple. For Hover's transfer concierge service, free for our audience, go to Hover.com slash frame. Welcome to Frame Rate 20. I'm Tom Merritt. Nope. Brian Brushwood doesn't know that he no, no, can't. No. We can't hear him. There we go. Now oh, we can. Now we've turned it back what? up. That, that, that wasn't my fault, though. No, right? no, no. I no was, you can go ahead and blame me. I was that, blaming that, you. That I was, was working fault. on my reverse ventriloquism skills. It's where you move your mouth <laughs> and nothing comes out. It's a long You really time. are a magician. Not about it. <laughs> and what's funny, and now I'm like, Tom, are you okay? I can't hear anything. You gotta, you gotta speak up. Uh, joining us today for uh, the Frame Raidery, uh, Mr. Glenn Rubenstein. Welcome to the show. Howdy, good to be back. Good to have you, uh, Glenn. I, we were going over your in the pre-show all the things you've done: uh, Game Center, GameSpot, TV.com, Lonely Girl. Uh, but you're just sort of kicking it freelancing. Yeah, things. hanging out, uh, watching a lot of uh, watching a lot of TV. Mm -hmm. uh, playing a lot of DC Universe online. That's what makes you qualified for the show. Yes, I watch uh, probably more TV than any human should. Now, I got a question, Glenn. I, yeah. I actually, uh, by all accounts, DC UO is fantastic, but I've held off on jumping in just because I want to save myself for my wedding night with uh, Star Wars: The Old Republic, are you are you playing both or no? I've been, you know, oh, like that. I, I was trying for a while. I was thinking about doing Rift. I was thinking about switching over, uh, but I don't know. Not since City of Heroes has there been a game that I have put this much time, effort, and energy I into. Loved capital L O V E D City of Heroes. It's the first MMO that mm -hmm. I really got into. Same so here. hearing about DC UL, that maybe I do got to jump in on that then. Yeah, no, it's phenomenal. I recommend I'm on the No Man's Land server, uh, Villain, Blizzard Man. I highly recommend getting getting on there. I've been playing it much more than I thought I would. All right. Awesome. Without further ado, let's get into the big story. This just in, the big story. I don't think I... I always find something new that I love about uh, the graphic... <laughs> That Meeks made for us. What, what was this it this time, week? It's the fact that you see the guy sort of just milling around in the background. This is supposed to be the big story. And you see this guy, he's got a piece of paper. He's just like, mm, yeah, that's the big story, all right. Guess we're going to talk about it. Maybe he's cooking up the big story. He's the author, so he's not impressed with it. He's, yeah, he's just like, turning it in. I wrote this big story. Well, the big story this week is uh, YouTube Live goes live at the YouTube Live page. At YouTube.com slash live. <laughs> well played, sir. Thank yeah, you. This was, this was kind of, I, I mean, it's not a huge surprise to anyone, but uh, I guess we had seen it only teased with special events before now, right? Yeah, they've done live events before, but this is a, a much bigger deal. They're, they're busting it out and making an entire portal. This, this casts them somewhere between Ustream and Netflix. They're not acquiring huge name stuff the way a Netflix or a Hulu is, but at the same time, they're curating it. They're only going to have a thousand or so partners, uh, and they're picking what stuff goes in here and is done live. So, for instance, right now, Coachella 2011 live broadcast, Indian Premier League cricket live from India, and uh, the Destructoid show 
So it's a mix of, you know, web originals. You see a lot of Revision 3 stuff on here. Uh, and then live events from sort of places that haven't got a lot of exposure, like the Indian Premier League cricket. Uh, full disclosure, actually, <laughs> this Thursday, we're going to be doing a scam school live. Oh, I see on, that. It's you, a, in the next seven days. Sarah, oh, is it really? They already yeah, got it promoted. Fantastic. Look at you. Uh, yeah, we're, uh, in fact, of all the things, and I, and I kind of want to know from a legal perspective, uh, let's say hypothetically, I had an amazing show uh, story about theoretically finding myself inadvertently cheating in a casino. Um, what's the statute of limitations to being able to tell that story? Because people have been asking me to tell it in public for a long time. And I was thinking if there was ever a place I was going to tell the story, it would be on Scam School. Right. So if I'm writing this, this <laughs> um, fake narrative of events in a Stephen King-like way, uh, and, you, and, and I've set the story in the present... And the Correct. main character is going to finally tell the story. I would yes. set the fictional events that you're speaking of probably before 2004. Well, theoretically, it definitely happened before 2004. So maybe hypothetically, I'll make up a story to tell. That'll be great on this upcoming edition of Scam School Live at YouTube.com slash live. Although now, th that, that's for law. <laughs> the law of the casino. Yeah, in theory, I would still Never be careful ends. when you start your car. In theory. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's and the problem, is, is theoretically, I really like going to casinos and would like to continue going to casinos. Check and would under like the <laughs> pillow for horse heads. <laughs> yeah. Just, you know, as a matter of course. That's what I worry about. But uh, so the whole YouTube Live thing, though, is uh, this is an interesting middle step. Now, traditionally, from a branding perspective and marketing, the one place you don't want to be is the mushy middle. You want to mean one thing and mean it very well. That's what we're seeing in the battle between Hulu and Netflix. Hulu means current shows on television. Uh, Netflix means archive shows in the back catalog that you would normally buy on DVD. And that's why both of them can be strong brands. This is a weird case of YouTube trying to step into the turf of Justin.tv and of, uh, I guess, Stickam, I don't know how popular they are these days, and, uh, and uh, Ustream. I, I, but the weird part is, is that they're only doing high-end content for this initial lo uh, launch, and they're not doing what I normally think of when I think of YouTube, which is, you know, kittens on, on pianos or, or that kind of thing. Like, is this going to work for them? What do you think? I don't. I think personally that if they wanted to, in a huge way, I mean, they could they could crush Justin TV, Stickam, and UStream very easily if they really wanted to open this up. And who knows? That could be the long term plan because I mean, I remember with uh, with sponsored content on YouTube that started with a limited select group of partners. I mean, we were part of that with Only Girl 15 uh, originally in the pilot program, and they always tend to roll things out from there after doing it sort of limited to start with. So, I mean, that could be their long-term plan with this, but I don't know. At the same time, though, as I think about it, it really seems to kind of mess with how I think of YouTube in terms of, you know, a recorded archive destination um, for just, you know, a variety of videos from professional to amateur but I think it'll probably largely just depend on what the response just depend on the response. I would think it does. It does have that flavor of being something that's being rolled out carefully. Yeah, that it was, it's in, in other words, this is part of a a greater plan where they did the YouTube concert and that was a big deal, mm -hmm. and then they they've done a few more live events, and now they're rolling it out to a wider thousands yeah. of people, and that maybe after that does well, you roll it out to to more people. But I agree that YouTube I think of as not just you know pre recorded stuff, but as uh, or original stuff, stuff caught on my phone, stuff that's you know very yeah. raw and it's not produced and it's just it's just a life. And that's why when Hulu was started, they're like, we're gonna crush YouTube with Hulu <laughs> because we because they believed they really believed in the movie industry that YouTube only existed to uh, pass along pirated movies yeah, and yeah. TV shows. And that wasn't true. What was yeah. cool about YouTube was this sort of slice of life stuff that you could share with friends and you could see weird things like cats surfing on And it was so pianos. wide open. I mean, yeah. you had everything, you know, on there. I've always assumed that the next logical step would be for YouTube to do a Ustream-like thing where yeah. it's, you can, from your phone, from your mobile device, just start streaming, like Quick, for instance. So this is, this is them actually moving another step towards the Hulu and Netflix saying we're actually going to go for original content. We're going to go for we're going to go for produced stuff, but we're going to place our bets on the folks who aren't getting the attention from Hollywood. Yeah. And I'll tell Wait, you here's, that's what oh, I'm sorry Brian, what were you going to say? 
Oh, well, I was going to say one of the things that's most curious to me about their, their the way they're rolling it out is the focus on scheduling, that there will be an event at this time. And the fact that if you go to YouTube.com slash live, you can click on a, a, a certain program and then click add to my Google calendar. So it'll automatically remind you there's a big focus on be there at this one time to watch it live, which, uh, again, man, that's not when I think of YouTube, I don't think of make sure to be there at a certain time to, yeah. so I don't miss my, my chance. I think of, you know, whatever I want, whenever I want it. And of course, you'll be able to watch the the programs archived after the fact. But again, it's 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 an interesting shift because YouTube means something to everyone right now. And if they're gonna, I mean, obviously they have the muscle of Google be behind them. But it'll be curious to see how they define the new space that they try to occupy. Well, and I think this is where the interesting opportunity is. And I don't know if this is this is sort of in their plan. But look at right now, and this is actually very timely with you look what's going on with NAB right now, and people talking about how broadcasting is changing. And YouTube, by default, you know, with Google's backing, if they decided that they wanted to be the hub for live video and live, you know, both in video podcast and even in the audio sense of having a, a one-stop hub that is already has presence on every smartphone, that already has, you know, huge presence in people's minds as a destination already, I think there's a huge opportunity there if that's what they want to do. And the YouTube widget is as ubiquitous as the Netflix widget. Exactly. So they're on people's televisions. They're yeah. on Xbox. They're, they're all over the place. They're on the Apple TV. So if they want to own this space, I mean, they've got, you know, the best the best chance of anyone if that's what they want to do. I can't say that I look at it and I'm compelled to want to watch. It's yet. It's still too much. I think that's still the that's the YouTube problem, in fact, is that there's there's just too much content, which is why I think they're smart by limiting their partners from the get go. But at the same time, if they don't have a lot of compelling content from the get go, how are they going to how are they going to hook people in? Well, and, and think about this. This is uh, this is a really good point because think about. I think one of the interesting land grabs will be who is not a big name in YouTube right now as a as a uh, vlogger, but who could be a good name because they're able to keep the conversation afloat. I mean, if you see a lot of the YouTube vlogs, there's a very clipped style, heavily edited, where people basically talk to a camera and they cut out all the ands and the ums and the distractions and yeah. all this other stuff. You take that same person, put him in front of the same camera, have it be live where he's got an hour to talk to his fans. Uh, you can have a very different outcome, and it'll be a different set of skills people have to draw upon in order to gauge their audience on a uh, on an emotional level. Folks have done that on Ustream a lot, though. It's not like that hasn't happened before. No, no, but but think about YouTube's cast of stars. Now, if yeah. I'm YouTube, the most obvious thing is to take our current set of stars and make them stars in this new arena. But like Fred. the things that make them a success yeah, Fred would in that live. arena will not be the things that mm. make them a success in another arena. No, that's true. I mean, even with Lonely Girl 15, like, we we could have done, and we did do something similar that were supposedly, like, one-take sort of live-style videos for the purpose of story, but we obviously never did anything, you know, with that sort of uh, on the fly. You didn't do a live shoot. No, I mean, yeah. well, we, we pretended, uh -huh. like, like things were for purposes of story, like, you know, this was uploaded all one-take raw mm -hmm. footage, or even, I think, uh, one time in my following series, Red Earth 88, we did something where we pretended that it was done with the record live from webcam feature that they, uh, I think they still have, where you can just sort of capture it mm -hmm. on the go to sort of give it that sense of real, you know, sort of just found footage footage almost you know in terms but that of, was that was a uh, a production oh, choice totally, totally. not yeah. something you were really doing which yeah is, so and that's the thing so i don't see fred i don't see things yeah. like that transferred to it but i do think there's an opportunity though because it's interesting i mean look at a lot of the big names in netcasting and podcasting um i mean even even with this show i mean you see that content gets put up on youtube but this might be a chance for uh things of that nature to get i think more of an audience you know, essentially use it as a distribution channel where there's already a lot of eyeballs. That's that's absolutely true. There, and then there's the other side of thing, which is uh, giving th lesser known uh, content a chance to be in front of a larger audience. Indian Premier League cricket, I think, is an interesting example of that, right? This is the kind of thing you'd have to pay $50 on DirecTV pay-per-view yeah. because it's not really worth their time to carry it unless they're going to make a lot of money from rabid cricket fans who can't find it anywhere else. Now it's available on YouTube. However, live right now, if I want to catch the Shanae Super Kings and the Kings 11 Punjab match, it says when I click, it says live now. I click through and it says, due to regional restrictions, the webcast will start in your region in 14 hours, 10 <laughs> minutes. No, no seconds. way. Really? How is that live now? There's so much stuff with geo-blocking going on. I mean, just over... And YouTube has it actually quite a bit, even with recorded stuff. Uh, so it's interesting that they would be pushing things uh, that, that are geo-blocked. We regret the inconvenience caused. Yeah.
that just I, I, you know so obviously there's there's a little programming because uh, that that makes me think well this this isn't very good yeah you know I, I it says something is a featured live event and it's live now and yet it's absolutely not live now agreed <sighs> yeah all right well let's move on then to another big story Stop everything. It's another big story. Cutting the cord has been one of those things that even Good Morning America and uh, the early show talk about. Everybody's wanting to know, when are we going to cut the cord? It's so mainstream now, it seems. I assume that means that we will get all of our television shows over Wi-Fi. In theory. Because personally, I have a cord that connects my internet. Oh, please, come on. No, the, only I, thing, the only thing that really bummed me out about this story was the headline. It says, study, more TV viewers in U.S. Caught cutting the cord. And, uh, oh, hold on, I just, I just got handed this here. It says here also, fish breathe water, fire hot, and stuff fall down. So we got those headlines <laughs> in there, too. That's right. You heard it here, folks, live on Twit. Stuff <laughs> still falling down. More I mean, it's, uh, I mean, I, of course, maybe, you know, we're in a bubble, of course. We live in this world where we all, for years now, how many, a half decade now, we've all talked about this dream, and many of us have already done it. Uh, but it, it is a significant study uh, or story when the public at large becomes at least familiar with the idea, uh, which I think is still happening. I don't know. I mean, do you think... Uh, is I, yeah, this, we are is, in a bubble. In fact, my, my reaction to this is usually, really, how many? Because yeah. uh, while lots of people I know have cut the cord and, and used the Internet as their entertainment device, whether it's for television shows or, or just other stuff, uh, it's really not mainstream yet. There's still it takes the majority, a majority, 80 million you know, to, to 100 people. million people yeah. subscribing to cable television. But according to this research, 2.07 million U.S. television subscribers will have cut the cord between 2008 and 2011. Uh, between 2008 and 2009 alone, the firm said that 550,000 households had cut the cord. And they're defining cut the cord as getting rid of cable television and in favor of over the air as well as streaming television options. Now, the only reason I and I was in that clubhouse for a little while, but having kids changes things when you rely just a little bit, not always when you rely just a little bit on boomerang, being able to keep your kids occupied for an hour where you can finally take a shower. I mean, it's like I mean, there's no. There's no way to do that with uh, the cord cut entirely. There's no automatic streaming, next program, next program, keep him engaged. So, when you're and, so, so what you're saying, Brian, is when you cut the umbilical cord, you have to reattach the other cord. That's correct. You're going to have a cord <laughs> one way or the other, bro. Yeah, Ain't gonna, no cutting all the cords. <laughs> you got to get your cords coming after you. Um, according to researchers, 2 million U.S. television subscribers by the end of 2011. Uh, that's a small number. Yeah, oh, that's yeah, no. relatively. I mean, that's that's what like one in 150 when, Americans. When yeah. uh, when Tech TV uh, left left us in 2004 to merge, it was at 40 million. 40 million households was not considered enough to be a viable network yeah. independently. I, I think we might have hit 50 million right at the end, but we when we were when we were put on sale, we had less than 40 million. And it was, and that was like you can't you can't run a network on forty million households. You have to be leveraged into other households. I believe G four was somewhere in the mid teens, which is why Comcast was so desperate to buy Tech TV and add those forty to fifty million households to G 4s existing eighteen million, uh, because then that would start to get them up above that fifty million point, uh, which gets you into respectable amount of households where you can compete for a rating and sell yeah, a real and, network and, and sell advertising. Two million is not enough to sell advertising on. And also, well, and, and, I'm sorry. And, and this is the total number. This isn't just how many did it this year, right? right. This, is the, this is the number between 2008 and 2011. So we could assume that maybe some folks had done it before 2008, which maybe bring it up to 3 million tops, uh, but it's still a small number. What do you think the ratio is of that in terms of the people that cut the cord and are legally getting their content and people that are cut the cord and are illegally getting their content? Oh. I mean, it depends on who you ask. If you're talking yeah. about the, you know, but what was the cricket match that we just tried to watch? I mean, if, if, if you know, is it illegal to get a region locked movie or something that's legal in one area? I mean, I guess technically it is illegal. Uh, I mean, look, you can't you can't take 30 steps on the Internet, not trip over an illegal file somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. And especially, I mean, when you look at YouTube, I mean, still, there's a lot, especially when you get into older stuff. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, VHS rips, you know, stuff. People have like, yeah. just archives of old content. So, uh, so uh, Web8742 points out, like, isn't Twit just 2 million? That's for a single channel yeah. of viewers. We're not in 2 million households. We're in 
hundreds of millions of households we, right. just in the you, United it, States. We're in technically billions any household of households within, within worldwide. Yeah. So when, when I talk about this 2 million number, it's not, oh, we have 2 million people watching a particular thing. It's potential We're saying viewers. There's 2 million potential viewers for your content, yeah. and you're not going to get all of them. Yeah. Right. Um, Correct. I mean, it really shifts. And then, I mean, I don't know. And the, you know, there's, I mean, they're, they've been tracking for years now when you look even uh, at, you know, what TV shows are the most torrented? What's what's sort of, you know, the viewership numbers in terms of the most popular shows? Uh, I guess that would kind of fall under cord cutters because, you know, it's not necessarily time shift. And some might even argue it's more accurate representation than even Nielsen because you have yeah. people that are really making an effort specifically to go out and get that show. And what about the mixed use, right? Because this yeah. isn't an either or. Most people uh, probably have both. Yeah. They probably have some kind of internet connection as well as a cable television connection. And there is probably a, some mixed use in the legal <laughs> versus illegal. I, I think uh, you everybody know, like, has a varying I degree. I mostly watch yeah. Hulu, but every once in a while I just have to get this movie or TV show. I, I so. feel like if... I I pay. I mean, oh, what were we gonna say, oh, Brian? Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Glenn. Oh no, I feel like if I pay the two hundred and fifty dollars a month that I pay to Comcast for all my various services, if I want to download something from the East Coast feed because I want to watch it a little early, I feel like I'm I'm morally okay. I'm okay with God in in my mind, but, you know. And and You're same right thing with, with like, their right. programs. I was subscribed to HBO. I never turned on HBO, but then yeah. some program that was on HBO, I was like, oh, that's right. I really wanted to watch that. Oh, it's not on at this time in this region. Blah de blah de blah. I was like, well, let's fix that because you bastards already got my money, and I'm gonna watch this damn show. And and DVRs mess up. Right? Yeah, mm -hmm. all the time. And so you 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 turn on your your DVR and you find out, oh, cleanse. Recording of the results show for American Idol didn't record. <laughs> not quite that bad. But no, Comcast, my Comcast DVR magically seems to start recordings like incrementally almost each week a minute later uh -huh. until I unplug the box, then replug it in it. and cancel the season pass and restart it. You know, I mean, it's really ridiculous how terrible their DVR software is. So I, well, I, I guess my point here is that the amount of people cutting the cord is not as significant to me as the level of viewership of Internet content. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, definitely. Well, no, I I disagree. I disagree because even if even no, if don't. the internet startups actually, you know what? I have a vested interest in agreeing with you. But uh, no, I want I want the revision threes of the twits and the next new networks to go take over the world. But even if that never happens, if we could just get the stuff we love now in a less encumbered way, in a less all or nothing, sit down and eat from this trough and be a good piggy kind of way, then that alone is still a victory for me. And if it's a case that people are watching the content, even if it's the same content, I'm still happy with it as long well, as they're not doing it the same old way. I actually don't disagree with that. I'm just saying I want to know what's the level of Internet viewership for everything. Whether it's a Hollywood-produced, you know, television show, whether it's a, a big studio movie, or whether it's something off Next New Networks, I don't really care. I'm just curious, like, how much content are people consuming that way via their Hulus and their YouTube yeah. Lives versus cable? And when they cut the cord, that that's the dramatic portion, right? That's the portion where they finally give up and say, <laughs> there just isn't any use for me having this anymore. Most people yeah. aren't at that point yet. And that, that will be a dramatic point when that happens. But I do now, think that... Number I wanted, oh, yeah. uh, real quick, uh, real quick, Glenn. Uh, that's the number I want to know is how many people are about to defect who are like this <laughs> close to like, boy, I tell you, if I didn't have kids, I'd be cutting that cord right this minute. I mean, they, they, they have to be doing internal surveys to get an idea for how frustrated people are with the traditional cable service. Every time I pay a cable bill, I think if not if not for news, if not for news and stuff that, you know, I just that isn't on Hulu, isn't on Netflix and that nobody in their right mind would pirate. Like I'm a big Degrassi fan. No no nobody in the in the illegal scene is interested in that show. No, you know, Hulu's not interested in that show. I have to have uh uh one of the digital Nickelodeon shows to watch that, one of those channels. You know, I think HBO I is cable. probably the thing blocking me because I, I actually I find that I don't watch news on television anymore because I find better sources streaming online. Uh, but HBO shows, unless I want to steal them, yeah. that's the only way I can get them because my uh, television provider, DirecTV, does not give me access to HBO Go, uh, yeah. whether I'm a subscriber or not. So I have to go, I have to do uh, HBO on DirecTV. But it, it, you know what? Those, those excuses are getting thinner and thinner all the time. I'm curious, Brian, why can't you satisfy your kids' need for video through something like 
YouTube, through Hulu, through through other you means know. than just turning on the channel? Is it the ease of use or is it the program selection where they just they hear about it from other kids and they have to have that show? What's funny is my kids could care less about what they hear from the other kids. Uh, my daughter, Penelope, she's seven years old, and she loves Boomerang, all the old classic Hanna-Barbera stuff, and I know I can trust it. The problem is, uh, like, early on, she loved the old Spider-Man cartoons. We would watch them on YouTube, and I don't know if those were legal or illegal or whatever, but they certainly weren't taken down. And, the, and I would leave her clicking through, and she got to where she could watch part one, and she could find the two to click on part two and the three, and then she'd click on the next one, but before we know it, it's, she's watching hilarious dub of Spider-Man fight, and it's all curse words, and, you know, <laughs> yeah, I've, it's I've like, it, it's a wilderness. I'm like, what am I doing? Let my kid run around loose in YouTube, and it's, 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 a, it's a trust and a curation and automatic feeding that, uh, that makes it to where I could be in the other room and know that she's, hey, this is her hour and a half, she's going to watch TV, and I know she's not going to come back with anything that I'm going to be like, well, I didn't expect to have this conversation just so yet. there's your business opportunity, YouTube. <laughs> You know, yeah. make make a yeah. make a kid safe stream. I cannot can understand in. why they don't allow people to VJ. Why is why does Hulu not allow me to subscribe to a person who, yeah. who comes on and says, "Hey guys, as you know, I'm Brian Brushwood, and I'm here to take you through all the greatest moments in the history of sci-fi. We started off watching the original Battlestar Galactica, and now we're going to start watching the new one. But I want you to watch for thing A, B, and C. Enjoy, and then uh, you know, and then like now before we go on to the next season, I want to take you back to this special that came back in you know 1984, and I want you to notice X, Y, and Z because it shows up again in this upcoming thing. YouTube, why why are we not subscribing to people instead of stations? Well, YouTube does have playlists i mean i believe for that purpose and can't people sort of i know i know it's not perfect i'm saying that you know i've had to rely on that before i mean because i watch a lot of old stuff i'm really big into weird obscure you know i spent the better part of the last week and watching episodes of kids incorporated for christ's sakes you know so hey, you yeah hi. which i've realized i got some crap from this from my friends on facebook but it's essentially glee is kids incorporated with better writing mm -hmm. uh and auto-tune you know but uh but i love to find things like this on youtube that's where i find playlists actually are quite helpful especially um i use youtube through Xbox Media Center or XBMC like on a PC uh, you know so I can watch it on the TV uh, easily and there especially it's like playlists are, are a godsend because without that you're just randomly sort of clicking and a lot of times yes, you get the weird remix but can you find you know? somebody else's playlist or are you making these playlists yourself no I'm fine sometimes finding playlists and then just copying and pasting it okay. into there yeah you know there you go kid safe playlists make one <laughs> and send it to Brian and Brushwood. Go, internet. <laughs> All right. Uh, by next Thursday, please. Let's uh, let's move on to yet another big story. Tuck in your bootstraps. It's yet another big story. Uh, this one actually from Ars Technica. Matthew Lazar has an article called "The Four Enemies of Indie Internet TV." Sounds the like a horseman of the internet apocalypse. Uh, Not Hor to, I, I'd be curious to hear how many of these you guys agree with. Since we have four of us here, including Jason, I want to I get a thumbs up, thumbs down as we run through the four horsemen. Okay, so the, the idea is, you know, in, independent internet television has the chance to grab you and make you want to cut the cord because you see the show on YouTube Live or you see the show on somebody's website or you watch Twit and you say, I'm just going to watch that from now on. What could stop this from happening? And this is very near and dear to our hearts here at Twit for sure. Uh <laughs> Horseman number one, data caps. I open the first seal and out bursts a pale horse by the name of data caps. Data caps. All of a sudden, I have Vangelis uh, running through my head. <laughs> uh, and yeah, well, I mean, I guess man. we're all familiar <laughs> with the idea of data caps. <laughs> Um, we could do an entire three-hour special just on data caps alone. The idea that, of course, uh, you know, you, you pay for your service, you pay for access to the roads, and they say, oh, hold on there, Tiger, don't drive too much on those roads. We're going to start charging you. And you're like, but the roads, they're already there, and I'm not damaging them by driving on them. They're like, yeah, but, you know. But we collect there. taxes off your fuel, so you don't really realize you're paying for them. Right. But on top of that, we would also, you know, only just drive 250 miles a, a month, please. And then after that, you just won't be able to drive at all. Or maybe we'll let you drive, but, you know, we're going to throttle it down to about 10 miles an hour. You'll still get there, but don't worry. So do you think this is a problem, yay, yay or nay? I do. But the question is, how are we going to fix it? Because they keep flirting with the idea because, of course, uh, all of the telecoms don't want to invest in more infrastructure and expanding their networks. Uh, they, it's much easier to come up with rules that curtail behavior. And, of course, uh, from a consumer's perspective, that's nothing but lousy. I do think this is a serious concern. But the question is, how do you solve it? 
I think it's a concern, but I also think there's a bit of propaganda in it in sort of pushing the story as hard as it's been pushed because I don't know about you guys, I've gone significantly over as far as my home usage from what is supposedly the data cap and so far, knock on wood, so good, you know, but I think that they're push, putting this out there to try and keep it in people's minds, but I think if they were enforcing this left and right for everybody that was going over, I think they'd have a lot of people just, you know, they'd essentially be booting off customers, you know. Glenn, Glenn, you can't use that argument of, you know, it's like, <laughs> oh, no, I, I get it. 55 is a ridiculous uh, speed limit, but... Uh, Cops didn't see it. I didn't do it. <laughs> no, I'm just saying that, you know, uh, but I agree. Look, I, I'm totally against it in principle. You know, I mean, I, look, I, as a guy, I've, I've gone over a terabyte in a month before, uh, you know, I mean, easily. So I think that uh, it, it's bad, um, definitely, but they seem so intent on pushing it. I'm, what I'm wondering about, though, is the actual enforcement. Have we seen a lot of stories of this actually being enforced? No, it doesn't matter. It's bad on principle. It's it is bad, bad on principle. It's a bad rule. But if they're putting it out there and they never enforce it, then... Then I don't know. I mean, well, what's the harm? If you want to being illegal and hooray yeah. for all the other idiot laws in the world. I mean, it's just like this is a terrible, this is a terrible <laughs> point of view. I mean, not that I, I mean, you're, you're a smart man and I respect you very much is what I meant to say. <laughs> I'm just saying that I think that because we've been hearing about this has been a story now. I mean, for, for quite some time. I mean, it seems like at least a year that I've been hearing about. Well, counts. I think the reason you don't see it enforced is because of the amount of discussion and fear yeah. around it that the, the ISPs are still very hesitant in wanting to crack down on it. They're only putting these things in place in most cases because they want to go after people they think are are actually abusing their networks with yeah, BitTorrent. Yeah, that are running uh, they web wanna, servers. They want to be know. able to go after that torrenter and, mm -hmm. and co cooperate with Hollywood and have another excuse for yeah, doing totally. it without getting into the copyright violation system. And we haven't seen a case like that in a long time. Yeah. We did see cases like that with Comcast, and they got taken to court. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they want to avoid that. So this, this is cover your ass material yeah. here. This isn't actually trying to, to yet clamp down on your bandwidth. But what it does is it, it brings us a little closer to the ability to say, well, we, everybody agrees that it's okay to have these bandwidth caps, so we just have to make <laughs> them a little lower because we don't want to spend the money you know, to improve the equipment on the head yeah. end. And we're, we're going to put out this myth that there isn't enough bandwidth capacity, even though there's, you know, there's no exafloods yeah. happening on the backbone. But as long as we keep you in fear and passivity around these bandwidth caps, then we'll be able to control you. And when we finally do want to force you to only watch NBC programming on Comcast unless you pay extra, we can get away with it. Well, I think it's, it's the cord cutters that they are trying to scare with this is the idea because they don't want you to keep your internet connection only cancel yeah. your incredibly expensive cable tv service and then just stream everything thinking that you're going to get something as good or better i think that's the main reason why it's there no and it's a terrible business yeah. practice. and it is I'm happening totally it is it. happening elsewhere in the world it's happening yeah. in australia it's happening in canada yeah, now no, there's a big fight uh we just haven't had an incident right here in the united states yet so everybody agrees data caps Absolutely. that's a real concern and if they ever do enforce it i would just remind people that's what your neighbor's wi-fi is for that's right. <laughs> yeah, they're Boy, probably not using, using all of their capacity. So. No way. All right. Uh, oh, ho horseman number two. The, when the, the second seal. When the lamb <laughs> opened the second seal, I saw the lack of a clear home theater standard. Uh, yeah. Federal Communications Commission currently running a procedure to get feedback on all vid, uh, but essentially there isn't that one box. There isn't that one way for us to easily get internet television onto our television. There's lots of ways, but there's not a standard. No, no, no. I, that's a problem. It's, wait, is this, you say it is a problem? I think it's a problem that it's, there's not one simple service that I could just recommend to people. There's nothing that I've seen yet that's like how TiVo was when TiVo first came out in the sense that it's like, get this box, it will change your life. It's all very simple. It's all very easy. I mean, I like some of the different options that I've seen, but I haven't seen one yet that's been like, I could use this and only this. Uh, I have. It's called a basic knowledge of ability to browse the internet. Well, <laughs> Look, I have a PC hooked up to my television. I've got, you know, like a 10 terabyte media server, you know, running through my house. And I, you know, use a uh, keyboard and uh, and a VNC to, to control everything. I'm talking about something that like my mom could use, right. you know. I know, but That's here's always the, thing. the problem with that as a solution. You yeah. have a whole lot of, of options and, and customization and all that, but not everybody yeah. can do that. Even if it's quote unquote not that difficult X, you know xbmc i think xbmc i think is the easiest front end option i've seen on the pc that i like but even with that i still have to to exit out you know and actually just use 
Skellner in the chat room says there will never be one solution. In a way, he's right. There won't be just one product from one company, but there is one solution for watching television. It's called a television. <laughs> you buy a television. You go in and say, I would like a television. There is not that one thing to ask for. There is not, give me the internet box. And they're like, oh, well, we have several. We have this one from Sony and this one from Microsoft. There, there isn't that yet. There are just lots of like, well, there's Google TV, but it's blocked, all of yeah. the Hulu stuff. And then you can get Roku, but then you only get Hulu Plus. And, and so there's, there's not the universal access box. But, Brian, you're saying that really all we need to do is just put a Mac Mini up on our computer and we're done, right? I mean, that's, that's what you could do today. If you want the best television viewing experience for online content, for offline content, for on-demand, whatever you want, whenever you want it, all you have to do, and as we've said before on this show, we aren't happy that it's the case, but there is a solution that's not very legal and just about every 17-year-old knows how to take advantage of. Now, uh, there, there's no reason why without any kind of standards or any kind of forced integration, the, the miracle box that makes television as wonderful as we all imagine it could be in the 21st century can't exist. It's the licensing deals that bog everything down. That's what's crushing yeah. the innovation. Look it's at not what the technology, Boxy you're right. Developed. And then they got hammered on it. And Boxy, Boxy wanted to be on the Apple TV, but Apple TV didn't like them using the, the, the hardware on there. So Apple TV crushed the Boxy. And they, I mean, it just, it, it's, it, it will be worked out eventually. The beginning of innovation is always ugly, as everybody jockeys for position. But sooner or later, common sense prevails, and we're already starting to see that, as we'll notice in some of our upcoming stories. Uh, then the last two I want to get through real quickly. They're actually very uh, close to each other, and we've really talked about them already. Mergers and acquisitions... The idea of ISPs buying content companies, Comcast buying NBC is the first example of that, and, and there may be more as people look and see if that works out for them. And priority access is the other horseman of this apocalypse, uh, which is big ISPs uh, starting to launch uh, neat new services that give you fast access to video uh, because they have these caps there that we <laughs> talked about earlier that keep you from being able to watch video across the web after a certain point but if you pay a little extra for the fast track video then you can watch that nbc video on your comcast connection and it doesn't count against your cap <laughs> anyway those are the, those are the last two horsemen we could debate these all day long uh um, yes we we actually uh should thank the horseman that brings us the ability to do frame rate which ones we because actually we opened the first seal of the sponsors of frame rate <laughs> and outbounded a yellow horse bejeweled with the th encrusted diamonds of all varieties, and its name was... Hover.com. All about making domain name registration and service simple. Uh, we were talking about this before the show. You've registered a ton of domain names on Hover. <laughs> and I didn't even know it. I forgot all about That's it. That's how easy That's it is. Because you don't sit there thinking, wow, I remember registering that domain name. I had to go through like 70 screens and uncheck all these boxes. Hover's simple. So simple, like you forgot you even did it. I, I did it live while we were on the air doing This Week in Tech because we found out about it. I made some joke about registering my daughter's name. And then all of a sudden I was like, whoa, this is really going out to thousands of people live. And I was like, I don't want somebody to squat on it. So I, I right then in the next five minutes was able to register pennybrushwood.com. Yeah, and so uh, Hover is it's not about selling you a bunch of other things when you register a domain name. It's about registering your domain name. And you can transfer your domain names from other services. If you want to move them over to Hover, it's $10 per domain name. And if you're like, man, that sounds complicated, it's not. It's actually really easy, but they'll they'll talk you through it on the phone. They have a no-hold policy for customer service calls Monday through Friday between 9 a.m. and 8 p.m. Eastern. You call, you get a live person. They do not put you on hold. They do not tell you your number in the queue. They do not make you wait through elevator music or pitches for other services. They help you transfer your domain. And in fact... As an exclusive, as a member of the Twit audience, you get free transfer concierge service. When you call, you get a live person, and they'll do the transferring. They'll just walk you right through it. They'll make oh, it all yeah. happen for you. Uh, so Hover handles the whole hassle of the transfer at no additional cost because you are a Twit member. So if you've got a, a, a domain name that you want to register or if you want to take advantage of that concierge service, go to Hover.com slash frame, and you'll also get 10% off of your domain so we should point out that this is, a unique, this is a unique url for frame rate so you can make us look good to our good friends who keep this show alive head on over to hover.com slash frame and uh register you know i still have one more daughter you can steal her domain you can <laughs> yeah. figure out her name what's her name again i'm not giving it out <laughs>
<laughs> Larry. Larry Brushwood is my other daughter. Go register LarryBrushwood.com right now. <laughs> Let's move on to Film Film. <laughs> Western feel to it, doesn't it? You know, I close my eyes and I see magical vistas with lots of scratches and dust all over them. Yeah, you see a, a, an empty desert and a man yeah, in black you know fleeing across it. And the gunslinger following him. And that gunslinger is Javier Bardem, apparently. Yeah! I guess jumping right into my favorite story of the entire thing. Have Javier Bardem closing on the Dark Tower deal. Now, I did not realize what an unusual deal this is. For those of you who don't know, of course, uh, Tom and I are both reading the Dark Tower series. Are, I mean, I've already read it, but Tom's finally reading it. Uh, I'm reading Planet Insomnia Dark- right now, by the way, just to give you a little update. Uh, I, I, I liked Salem's Lot. I was fine. Insomnia, though, I'm loving the concept, but wow, is it overwritten. Like, it just takes it forever. It's like the bad guy shows up, and I'm like, okay, it's the bad guy. What's going to happen? The bad guy's fingers were covered with dirt. His aura was dirt-covered, too. It sprung from his nails like dirt. I'm like, oh, please, I know it's the bad guy. Let's just move on with it, for God's sakes. Anyway, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, I had to get but, that out uh, of my but system. One of, the, one of the unusual things, for those of you who don't know, this is a very unusual deal they're doing. And, of course, uh, in, in that uh, there, it's seven books originally, but it's going to be made into three movies. And in between the first and second movie will be a limited-run television show that tells more of the story. And then in between the second and third movies will be a prequel run that tells what happens even farther earlier on. So in order to get somebody to be cast as uh, Roland Deschain of, of Gilead, you had to have somebody who was willing to work a deal to be in a series of movies and be in a series of television shows all playing the same character. And of course, uh, I mean, th- this is, if nothing else, a fascinating experiment in, in cross-pollination between vastly different mediums. And I, well, for one, am super curious how it comes going to turn out I got to admit, when I first heard about all this, I heard about uh, a certain major character being a, um, a completely computer generated. I was highly skeptical, but uh, this little bit of information has me a little bit optimistic. Where are you at this, Tom? Now, Glenn, I cut you off earlier. No. Have you read the Dark no, Tower? No, I haven't. Uh, I'm a somewhat of a Stephen King fan, but I tend to prefer more stuff like like Stand by Me, It, you know, The Stand, things like that. It so. is part of the Dark Tower universe. Well, there you go. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I love the approach with this. I've been a huge, huge fan ever since I first heard about this this approach, just because I think in the last ten years, especially, I mean, TV has really been kicking butt on movies to. The the point where it's like I seldom go to the movies anymore or watch uh, films just because television has gotten so much better. So I think that this is a very uh, savvy way to sort of really play to the strengths of both mediums. Now, I have to say, I was talking about the book Insomnia earlier mm. when I was trashing the, the writing. I actually like Stephen King. I like his writing, and I'm a huge fan of Dark Tower. I am through books one through four. I'm super excited about this. But on top of being excited about the content, I'm excited about the different way they're going about mm-hmm. doing this, saying, you know what, let's pick the form that matches the best way to tell this story. Let's do movies, let's do television shows, let's have them complement each other rather than force it, forcing it into, you know, we talked about Dune last week on, yeah. on Frame Rate, forcing it into a medium, finding the best way to tell the story. And I, and I hope they, that it works out for them because I like the idea of taking these kinds of risks. So I am unbelievably excited about this story. I'm unbelievably excited that it's coming to the big and small screen. But there's one niggling little thought that just keeps poking up in the back of my mind, uh, and it is this. Tom, Glenn, Jason, please name for me one really good Stephen King movie. The Shining. I right? Thought, yeah. I thought Absolutely. the Stand miniseries okay. was good. Hold on. Uh, the Shining was hated by... Uh, by Stephen King. He hated it so much that he had it remade as a way epically worse miniseries. Yeah, horrible or miniseries. or uh, Stand By Me. Yeah. Okay, no, it, Stand By Me is legit. That is a good one. That actually does give me hope. Yeah. Or, uh, I guess, Shawshank Redemption and Green Shawshank Mile. Shawshank Redemption. Those are both definitely good. I liked Carrie. I thought Carrie was a, was a solid film. I, I did not think Carrie stood up well over time. I saw it in the early 90s, and I was just like, this is kind of You know, silly. if you stop watching it about 20 minutes before it ends, it's a lovely tale <laughs> about a misfit girl with a crazy mom who uh, a nice guy asked her out to the prom. It is. It's it kind of like she's all that. Uh, okay, well, that, those give me... Uh, so what we're saying is that... Uh, 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 wait, what's his name? The guy who did uh, Walking Dead and did Shawshank? Kirkman? In, in my, oh, Darabont. Yes. Uh, yes, we need Frank Darabont to do this. But well, uh, instead, this... Yeah, 
Cosmic, or Cosmic Man in the uh, chat room says that TV, film, and comic book writer Mark Verheiden, I think is how you pronounce his name, has been tapped to co-write with Akiva Goldsman the TV series of Dark Tower. Does Could that, be good. Could be good. Could be good. I'm. I'm. They just, create. They. Such... They. They were. They were the creative minds behind A Beautiful Mind and the Da Vinci Code movie. Okay. So um, I I will say uh, unequivocally that I am on guard because this is such a precious franchise and such a precious story for me. I just don't want to be heartbroken. So you're going to see a lot of, you know, this is like me and Iron Man. When Iron Ver Man Heiden, out, Ver Heiden was also a writer and co-exec on Battlestar Galactica on Sci-Fi. And isn't Ron Howard doing the film? Ron Howard uh, is directing the film. Yes. Correct. This is all a Ron Howard project. This uh, Verheiden's being brought on as a, a writer and exec. Sure. I don't know. I, I, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. I, I just, when I think of grit and a, a fearful, dark, twisted world, I, uh, Ron Howard doesn't pop directly into my mind. Is his That's brother going to be guesting? <laughs> his brother pops up as the guy in the desert in book one? <laughs> yes, well, exactly. Hello. He's, he's running a saloon in the middle of the twisted old west. What happened to your mule? <laughs> Would you like some whiskey? He was so cute as a kid. How did Clint Howard just grow up to be such a weird-looking guy? I don't know. I think it's all done in makeup, actually. He's actually quite <laughs> handsome in person. Have you ever seen him in real life? Me well, either. No, no. So yeah. that's, that's a, he knows what works for It's him. the magic of Hollywood. Yeah. Make he me could, look uh, hideous. <laughs> he could give Steve Buscemi a for his money. Peter Jackson has announced via his Facebook page that The Hobbit is being shot 48 frames per second. So he thinks this will ameliorate the 3D headaches that people have comp complained of in the last few years. Uh, film has been shot at 24 frames per second since the 20s. So doubling it uh, will allow you to uh, improve the 3D. Now, this is, a, this is first of all, I, I think a good thing because in the marketplace of ideas, we now have competition because I remember... There was a giant article that Roger Ebert wrote just trashing 3D saying, I wish I, you know, it could all be 60 frames per second because I saw that once and that was absolutely amazing. Well, now we're going to find out with, with this experience. But I wonder, it seems to me like the faster the frame rate, the closer we get to the experience of watching a sporting event where it feels like a window that you're looking through into another world. And, uh, uh, and it, I'm afraid that if the window is too clear, we see the world for what it is which is a bunch of regular people shuffling around pretending to be characters. There's something about that 24 frames per second. Hey, wait a minute. That, that's that guy who played Watson on the Sherlock series. That's not a hobbit. Exactly. Well, and, and it's like um, uh, I, I popped in. Uh, I, got, I got a new TV that's supposed to upsample. Oh, stuff yeah, yeah. 240 hertz. And Doesn't it, it look it, weird when you do that? It, it looks so weird. I, I, I disabled it. I <laughs> mm -hmm. put in cool hand Luke, and I was like, these are just goobers sitting on a porch it pretending makes, to be other people. It makes it look like, like C-SPAN programming or something, like a weird public access look with the, the realism of it. it uh, yeah, it totally trips me out. I tried that. Tried that it was too it. real, and I'm afraid yeah. we're going to see that with The Hobbit. And that'll be, I, I, in fact, I predict that'll be the first, like, blow up in our faces, like, whoa. A lot of people felt the same way about this. Well, we will keep an eye on the frame rate of The Hobbit and how it affects oh! its viewing. Well played, sir. Well played. <laughs> it's almost like we named the show on purpose. Uh, <laughs> and finally, we were wondering when this would happen. Well, it happened seven days ago. Uh, but seven days ago, we had already done the show. Uh, movie studios have sued Zadiva. <laughs> Zadiva, if you don't remember, is the, is the company that is streaming DVD video to you, but only one DVD at a time. So if they have 10 copies of The Dark Knight, for instance, and 10 people have rented it, Nobody else can get a stream of it because they're only streaming the video of individual DVDs thinking that would get them around the licensing rules because you don't need a license to rent DVDs. Why would you need a license to just say, we'll keep the DVD player over here and just send the video to you? This reminds me of the real network's lawsuit where they had that DVD encryption thing where, where it, it, it's a, something that, that made sense. Their case made sense. Like, you're right. It does pretty much mean the same as X and X and X, but you're violating the law for these, for these reasons. Fox, and, uh, Warner Brothers, Disney, 20th Century Fox, which is apparently a different company than Fox, Paramount, <laughs> and Universal jointly sued the startup. So they're not taking any new signups. This is mp3.com all over again. Like what they yes. did with their with their uh, streaming service. I mean, it, it's it's one of those things where, on one hand, I love the brilliance of the thought behind it of like this is how we will circumvent because technically, but it seems like those people, unless they have a lot of money, 
to, to defend themselves in court are never going to get their well, day what, to be proven right. What's funny about it, it's the same argument that Time... Well, we're going to talk about this in Tube yeah. Tops, actually. The Time Warner and Cablevision are making, saying, mm -hmm. hey, it's the same video. We're just putting it on a different screen. Yeah. That's well, all. And remember what I said earlier about, like, there comes a time, it's ugly in the beginning, but eventually... At some point, common sense starts to prevail. And that's what we're seeing with uh, Amazon's bold moves with the, with, that we're seeing with, with this. Well, we'll talk about it. Let's, you guys want to move up to the tube tops? Um, yeah, actually, let's, let's, uh, let's go ahead and move up to the uh, tube tops. Oops. So, yes, Time Warner and Viacom are suing each other over this idea, uh, and uh, Viacom has sent a nasty note, not yet a cease and desist, to Cablevision over this idea that they are streaming video channels, TV channels, to people's iPads over Wi-Fi only within their own house with a cable modem that is validated as this is the cable modem of a subscriber. They, the cable companies say we're allowed to do this because our agreement doesn't limit the number of televisions we can put the signal on. It just says we're, we're able to broadcast the signal to our subscribers. And, and the uh, studios, well, in this case, Viacom, saying you can't do that. You're sending it over a different channel to a different kind of screen to a mobile device, and that's not allowed. So much common I mean, sense. No wonder people are, people are pissed off about it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, and what was the bold move that, uh, what's funny is I only half remembered it. What was the bold move that Amazon did the other day that uh, we were talking about on, on this week? Well, you're, you're talking about the MP3s where they are saying, we'll store your yes. MP3s. Uh, this is it. And this is MP3.com all over again, right? Yeah. And MP3 mm -hmm. tunes even more so. Yeah. Which is, we're going to be a locker. And all of your music will be stored in an Amazon locker. Uh, you'll get five gigabytes free. Uh, and we'll actually give you more uh, gigabytes if you want to pay for them. And every piece of music you buy from Amazon gets stored for free in the locker as well. And they didn't make a deal with anyone yeah. because they're saying, look, they paid for the file. We're just storing it for them. So what I, what I suspect is happening here is in the beginning, only crazy people with nothing to lose would try something so bold. And that's why we saw the mp3.com that Michael Robertson did. And of mm -hmm. course they got sued and, and in the most crushing judgment of all time up until then. Uh, and, uh, but then over time, once we come to understand this new space, you see larger and larger enterprises saying, yeah, this is really dumb the way we're doing it. And it should just be this way. And you get, uh, you get people to where it's harder and harder to push them off the cliff, which is why you have Amazon doing something that I think is in, is in keeping with the spirit of the current law, if not the letter. And same thing with, uh, with, with this decision right now, uh, streaming to individual devices. Because what does it mean, television? I mean, it's like, oh, I'm sorry, unless you you know, have a cathode ray tube and rabbit ears, then it's not really a television. It's a viewing device. I mean, it's all, it's, it's all the same thing. So I'm, I, for one, am glad to see more dusts up, dust ups between big companies trying to make something that, again, is just going to benefit the consumer. Yeah, and, I, I, and this, is, this is interesting. And I don't think it's just because they didn't believe in this before. I think the number of people who had the technological capacity and know-how to take advantage of it was too small before. Amazon didn't avoid doing an MP3 locker before because they didn't think it was because they, they thought it was crazy. It was because they're like, not that many people have broadband connections, not that many people are buying digital music. Now they are. Now's the time to do it. Whereas Chris Robertson was always like, I don't care how many people are out there. I know a bunch of geeks. I know I can make some money off of them, whether it's a large amount of people or not. What was interesting right. too is MP3.com. I mean, required physical validation. I mean, you had to insert your CD. It read from that. It verified that you had the physical copy of it. I mean, with Amazon, with their cloud space, you can just toss anything in there, right? Yeah. You can, yeah. You can put anything up there you want. off. It, it's just cloud storage. Yeah. It's no different than if you went to Amazon's S3 service mm -hmm. and bought space and put it up there, except that Amazon is providing a little piece of software that will look for all the music files and make a nice little playlist system. For I'm them. really curious because Apple hasn't improved this yet for the iPhone, for the player. I know it's on Droid, but right. it's on there. I mean, that's the thing. And if they don't, you know, honestly, I, like, I've had uh, an iPhone for a while now, but I still use an iPod uh, for music. But it's the sort of thing where just the idea of it has me thinking, you know, uh, if, if they don't approve it, if even just setting up uh, an FTP server and using something like Oplay or just to have my own yeah. streaming music because it's just so much more convenient. Well, that's the thing is all of the... It, all of this stuff, and it goes back to the idea of, of Zadiva as well. All of this stuff is thing is something you can do in your own house. Why is it illegal for someone else to provide the service part of it? 
Yeah, I think that's I, I, can, I can put a I can yeah. put a hard drive on a network and stream all of my music off of it, like you're talking yeah. about. I can put a DVD player in another room and stream the video over to me. Just because it's farther apart, I, it's I illegal. Because they're afraid when it goes beyond just the 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 hardcore uh, power users. I mean, it's it's like what Brian was saying about in terms of PC being the best box. You know, of course, we all know that we could do that right now and set up our own streaming music servers for ourselves. But I think when it becomes mainstream, that's when they get really nervous. I think it's because they're trying to preserve an old business model mm -hmm. that had inefficiencies built in that aren't built in anymore. And so they're trying to have the law come in and make the inefficiencies part of the law. Yeah. It's like, well, now that you can actually use a network to put anything you want anywhere you are, you anywhere you want, let's have the law make it pretend like they're big, heavy pieces of, of, of product that have to be shoved around on trucks. Well, and so much of this is because... The internet is now a truck! The entertainment companies no longer have the control that they once did over these technologies. I mean, Blu-ray Blu not really catching on quite to the level of the DVD did, is even a great example in terms of, you know, I mean, look at before with CDs and whatnot. They had, you know, somewhat of a lock on these formats with their various agreements, with their various controlling interests, and then you look at companies like Sony that have an entertainment arm and a uh, uh, hardware arm um, and now since Apple on the music side and now with streaming on the video side I think that they're really scared because they don't have that control that they once did and yes yeah. they're clinging to these inefficiencies that control was a, it was ephemeral anyway yeah that control existed because of of an accident of physical location because they knew it was hard to copy things. But they had these exact same op objections to the VCR. Yeah. Because in their imagination, they thought people were just going to do widespread copying. Until they copy. figured out how to they use had, it to their advantage. They had the exact same objection to cassettes. Yes. Because they thought this was going to undermine their business until they figured out, oh, well, people don't copy in, in great numbers. Now their thing is, well, people can copy in infinite numbers. And they're right. But that doesn't mean that we just shoved the genie bunk in the I don't know that's, how many that's, times that's, have that's I said the, this. And that's really the problem. i tired of hearing myself. That's really the problem that I think they have is that I think Napster is really what just blew the doors off as far as music is concerned. And I think now with streaming video and with YouTube, I think we're starting to, we, we've seen, I think, a more gradual, not in sort of the same way that Napster was, you know, the main easy target. But I think with video, we've definitely saw that with YouTube and then, them going after YouTube. The, I, the same really thing changed. happened with ships. <laughs> When ships became easy to move things from Europe or, you know, across the mm -hmm. channel and across and from North America and all this tobacco, everyone started putting up tariffs because it used to be hard to get your tin out of Cornwall and, and, and down the coast. And now it was so much easier because we have these big sailing ships. So we have to put in a fake barrier to things. I will We've see never that learned. and go one further. I mean, look at, look at fossil fuels, look at corn syrup and industries like that. The people that have a vested interest in the current broken infrastructure and profiting off of it, they are the people that are going to make sure that nothing new and more efficient comes along to replace it, even if it is way better for the consumer because they want to keep their monopoly on it. It's, it's really like the shamans who knew how to make fire. <laughs> and they wouldn't let anyone else know because they wanted them to think it was magic. It was just flint. That's all it was. You still with us, Brian? Nope. We just lost him. <laughs> ah. <laughs> yeah, just, and it we, appears, uh, yeah. He's, he's gone. gone. Yeah. He's, he's like, I'm tired of this mercantilism <laughs> talk. I'm out of here. <laughs> all right. I'll uh, continue trying to get him back on. Real quickly, uh, Dish uh, bought Blockbuster. Blockbuster ha had gone bankrupt. Uh, and so Dish Networks has has waded in and paid three hundred twenty million to pick up the scraps. Here's my first response: Dish Network has three hundred twenty million dollars laying around. Like, do you Dish, think Dish it Network's still in business? Was it like when you bought a used DVD at Blockbuster? You're like, <laughs> yeah. oh, this one's only nine ninety nine. They were just going through the bargain bankruptcy bin. Like, oh look, Blockbuster's only three twenty million. Oh, let's just let's pick it up. Yeah, why not? Yeah. No, that's I uh, would have never bought it at full price, <laughs> but since it's on sale. It's amazing, you know, just how, I mean, Blockbuster, I mean, think about that. Just the fact 10 years ago, Blockbuster was still a very viable company. Um, and, and then just to see sort of how they, they completely went into such a tailspin and whatnot. Now with Dish, I mean, it's, it's interesting. But I wonder what, what's the value to Dish, though, in this necessarily? Uh, the value to Dish is that they get a little bit of their streaming catalog. Mm. Uh, they get to put Dish Network uh, uh, devices in stores, in stores and yeah. try to sell them to the few what people stores are left? who are yeah. still going to <laughs> Blockbuster stores. Have you been to a Blockbuster recently? I God, No, I don't think I've been to Blockbuster since I lived in Austin, Texas. I, I went there on Christmas time. I was trying to track down a copy of Point Break on DVD for a gift, <laughs> which was out of print, and I found one at a Blockbuster. It was very <laughs> depressing. They tried to sell me a lot of stuff. 
And I just was like, no, I just want the seven dollar DVD. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's uh, take a quick break and uh, thank our other sponsor for this show, which is Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to start a high quality website or blog. Uh, if you're into this stuff, if you want, maybe you want to start a website that explains why you think we need reform of copyright laws, or maybe you're just a fan of Lost, or or maybe you're just a fan of a TV show, and you and you want to gather a bunch of people together in a community. You can be up and running before I'm done telling you about Squarespace. That's how fast it is. Go to squarespace.com slash frame rate. Uh, you can import an old blog from WordPress or movable type. Uh, you can include modules for Twitter. Uh, you can include forum builders. You can include Google Maps. Whatever it is you need, you can put it in. It's so easy. It's 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 just drag and drop. You just select things. You, you put it in the window. It's, it's point and click. That's all you need to do. And you're up and running for for free. You don't even need a credit card. Just go to squarespace.com slash frame rate. Start your blog right now and you get a 14 day free trial. Sign up for that free account. You'll, if you like it, uh, I, I think you'll probably want to keep it. But you don't have to. You can try all different kinds uh, of, of different ideas, import blogs, try the different templates. You don't have to know a lick of CSS, although if you want to, you can mess with the code. They don't keep you out of the code. They don't keep you out of anything. It's data portability. Bring your data in. You can take it away with you when you leave. Squarespace.com slash frame rate, and we thank them for their support. Dude, do you know how easy frame, uh, frame rate uh, Squarespace is? I know frame rate's hard, but how easy is Squarespace? Wow, that's how easy it is. It just makes you smile. It pastes a smile right across your face. Oh. And you and you, you just never want to do anything else. No. Nope. Squarespace.com slash frame rate. <laughs> All right, let's uh let us move on to interferon. So um, interferon is our, our web video uh, section. We've got a couple in here to show you before we get to feedback. We'll do this real quickly. First of all, uh, this was up on Boing Boing this week, and I absolutely find it hilariously disturbing. It's some early work that Jim Henson had done for the Wilkins Coffee Company. Uh, it was put up uh, on YouTube uh, by the folks at, uh, what's the name of the Network Awesome. Uh, and I don't know where they collected him from, but but it goes from 1957 through the 70s. We'll show you just a few of them. I never tasted it. Now, what do you think of Wilkins? <laughs> this is my favorite one. Care for a cup of Wilkins coffee? No, I don't like coffee. <laughs> this has been a public service. You don't like coffee? You get shot in the head. Why don't we see Wilkins that in advertising coffee. anymore? We're here to yeah. persuade people to drink more Wilkins coffee. What's the club for? <laughs> to get their attention. <laughs> and you can tell that's Jim Henson's voice. Like oh, yeah, that's totally, totally recognizable. Anyway, the thing goes on forever. It's that's it's great. it's absolutely hilarious. Uh, I love that stuff. Um, and uh, do we do we have Brian back now? Oh, we do. Because I'm I back. I but uh, I, meanwhile, me and all the chat room are hanging out, wondering why the feed keeps going a little bit squirrely on us. So well, I don't you know what? what? I wasn't mentioning it because the people on the podcast have no idea that the feed's been squirrely. So I've just you didn't been... mention that I was suddenly gone too. We well, did mention that you were gone because you you were obviously <laughs> gone. I know, but then you. But now you pin it on me, like it's me, and I'm the one. But I didn't do it. What? I. No one who is watching the podcast has any idea what you're talking about. So why don't you tell us about two by fours going through the windshield? <laughs> this is something that uh, that just sh popped up on my radar last night, and it's it's 30 seconds of why am I looking at this, and then one second of oh my. In fact, oh there we go. You already shot it right here. Yep. If you got audio, that makes it all the better. This lady's been cut off by two guys who are blocking the lanes, and so. She's, so she starts shooting video. Well, this looks like my commute to Petaluma every morning. There's always some guy in the left lane just like, oh, geez. Holy, that was scary. Exactly, wow. right? You see, it's just, it's the exact perfect amount of time for you to let your guard down and wonder wow. why you're watching this. And you're like, this is dumb. Why that's, is she shooting other people? The scary. guy runs over a two by four, it flips up in the air and blasts at mega volume right through the, the windshield right in front of you, dude. Yeah. It's awesome. Go uh, look for a two by four through my windshield. Dot, Where dot, is, dot. I'm trying and to see, now that I know it's coming. Yeah, there it is. Oh, you see it off the side of the road. Wow, that is wow. really scary. Now, did the truck stop and come back and help? 
I wonder. Uh, I, I don't know the story, but I do know that a well-respected car blog did some check. Because when I first looked at it, everybody was saying, there's no way this is real. This is totally bogus. But uh, the car blog who featured it uh, got the name of the lady and verified why she was taking the video. Because, I mean, it is kind of weird. Like, why didn't she scream? And, you know, but but if, you're, if I'm driving, I can understand it being so fast that you're not even having a moment to react. All yeah. you hear is the tire squealing when she slams on the brake. Well, I've been in that situation. I wasn't driving. Eileen was driving. But we had a tire f come out of nowhere. And uh, oh, wow. smash the hood of our car. I can't believe that, that that woman walked away okay. I mean, that that two by four could have got her in the neck. Yeah, that's, no, yeah, that's intense. intense. It's a reminder of why you should always, always have a video camera going. Yeah, you're yeah. The wheel you should be holding a video camera mounted, while you're driving mounted to your at all dashboard. times. It is a reminder uh, of that. You realize that that's the reason that Steven Spielberg no longer believed in UFOs. Because back when he did Close Encounters of the Third Kind, he was a big believer that it was like, no, 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 we're definitely being visited by something This the, you can't explain all these sightings. But now, 30 years later, 20 years later, when he did War of the Worlds, he said, well, the problem is now everybody has a, a high-quality camera on them at all times, and yet we have the exact same number of sightings. If we really were being visited by aliens, we would have caught them all on tape because we can tape everything all the time now. So road rage is what, what led us to be able to disprove aliens. <laughs> in a roundabout way. In a roundabout sort of way. Uh, Aaron OX43 has created streamdown.squarespace.com. So if you want to know if the Twitch stream is up or down, there you go. That's how that's how easy it is. That's how fast. Go to streamdown.squarespace.com. It'll tell you the well, stream is having right issues. Now. Yeah. I'm going to check it. There it is. It's already up. Yeah. Huh. It says here the stream is having <laughs> issues. <laughs> OMG. The, the stream, stream is stuttering. stuttering. <laughs> yeah. There you go. All right, let's move on to our feedback. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Friday. Oh, yeah. <laughs> huh. okay. Yeah. I don't know why that happened. Uh, so um, we've got a uh, um, video question or no? Wait a yeah, minute. no, a video we question. Do. People, ever since Kuhan sent in his feedback, so other people have started sending in video comments as well. This one, uh, well, uh, it's, it's short and sweet. They're keeping it under, you know, under a minute, 30 seconds long. If you want to go ahead and play it, let's take a look. All right, we're going we're gonna to queue it up here. But, yeah, if you, if you send us short questions, you have a better chance of making it on the show. Here's, here's a, uh, a loading screen <laughs> of your question. Don't believe me? There you go. <laughs> Uh, coming, <laughs> coming to us. Uh, you know what? Maybe, maybe we'll get it next week if it doesn't come up here. But the first letter says, oh, "Mr. Hey. Brian Brushwood, you sir are nuts." I don't think many people will spend thirty dollars to watch a recent theater movie in their home, and no one in their right not mind is going to spend sixty dollars to watch a movie in theaters at home. Anyone who does obviously has way too much money and needs to be put and needs to send some of it my way. I watch ninety-five percent of my movies on my twenty-inch CRT monitor, and it works fine for me. But to spend thirty to sixty dollars to watch it on this dinky old monitor just feels wrong. Maybe if Apple released this business model, it might work, but I don't think any other company could pull this off. Love the show, Steve B. Well, sir, I stand corrected, you. Glenn, would you pay $30 to watch a, uh, a recent movie just out of the theaters that's not out on DVD yet? No way. No way. No way. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it, you know, I could get a hotel room and watch it on pay-per-view for that much. Uh, well, you no, know, this is before yeah. it hits the pay-per-view window. Really? So, well, yeah. so that, still, that's even the then, idea. Even then. When, what's the last movie you saw that was even worth that much money? Well, I I've, I uh, usually spend around twenty two dollars to go see a movie with my wife. So. What's the last movie you saw they really thought was worth it? Well, I see lots of movies that are worth that I'm like. But really, yeah, that was full fun. full amount. I mean, I see a lot of movies that are okay, but you know. Glenn, and, I swear that I have not seen a movie in the last year that I have not spent a hundred dollars to go see. Between <laughs> the Babysitter, yeah, I believe it. Eel, because we go watch at the Alamo Draft House. And uh, I, you can't walk out of that place without spending eighty dollars. No, that's true. Well, that's more an experience. I mean, that's like going to the ArcLight. That's you know a little more uh, sort of upscale. But I don't know. I mean, for me, you know, I go to a lot of movies here in town. I mean, it's, it's fairly inexpensive. But even then, I feel like it. At dead, you know, could, could you ten dollars. Could you take a Could you take a family of four to any of those theaters and watch a movie and walk out of there See, spending? I don't less, think I would. I think TV is so much better than film these days. You what know, if you could rent the family of four, well. For if, if the family is part of the thirty dollars, you know, if I got a souvenir photo, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have our we have our video loaded. We were loading the wrong, wrong link uh, yeah, earlier, so now we now we've got the right link. And uh, take it away, caller, you're on the air. You're on hey, the YouTube. I just wanted to share something neat with you regarding Netflix because I know you discuss them a lot on the show. 
uh, I saw this announcement in the iTunes store where Netflix boldly proclaimed that their next update would fix an issue that prevented some Canadian users from being able to watch video. I'm not sure that's ever getting fixed. And uh, I think the international viewers would appreciate that, especially. Anyhow, love the show. Keep doing what you're doing. It's It's been very entertaining. I mean, every episode better than the next. Keep it up, guys. <laughs> every episode is better noticed. than the next. <laughs> I wouldn't have noticed it if he didn't point it out in the video. But certainly, if there's one thing that we keep getting on every comment we make on Twitter, every time we slip up and talk about how great something is here in the United States uh, on frame rate, we get an avalanche of emails. We get it. It sucks. The geographic uh, limitations, the artificial constraints they put on there are not fair. I agree. I, uh, I want to say also that if you send us a, a video feedback like that, uh, you do not have to wear a tie. But, but, it, but, or, it, but or it is be standing in front of a green screen. It is That's appreciated. Not required. It is appreciated. I say if you, you do if you dress up. I know? say you have to be in front of a green screen and you have to wear a novelty fish tie. In fact, whoever sends us a video in front of a green screen with a novelty fish tie automatically gets in the show. <laughs> yeah. No matter how long your video is. Now we may not play the whole video, but if you're wearing the fish tie, you will get on the show. Correct. Uh, Paul Meyer wrote in and said, concerning Time Warner Cable streaming shows to the iPad, Tom briefly mentioned Slingbox and all this. I wonder why the network seemed to have no problem with this awesome service when I can stream live or pre-recorded shows to my Android phone wherever I am. Is it because TiVo isn't considered a content provider or that networks believe only a small percentage of nerds use Slingbox? I'm curious what you guys think. Uh, Paul, they have a huge problem with Slingbox, but they haven't figured out a legal leg to stand on with them because it's one-to-one -one broadcasting. I'm taking something from my house and broadcasting it. I'm not broadcasting it. I'm single casting it only to me. Uh, right. Whereas Zadiva, they're on that line because they are sending video from them to one other person. So there's at least two and arguably broadcasting because multiple people can watch the same movie, even if it is theoretically a different copy of it. And I think maybe that's the, the technicality is that with Slingbox, they're selling you the technology to allow you to stream something to yourself, whereas the other sites are selling you mm. the stream. Yeah, there's a little bit of the uh, radar detector. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> defense in there as well. We just yeah. make the Slingbox. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we don't tell them they should stream being human. Off sci-fi. But I think it's, if they could figure out a way to go after it, I think, I think they, they would have by now. Or if their market share shoots up enough that there's, you know, worthwhile for them to go after it, I'm sure they would. All right. Uh, should we go one more email and then, then get out of here, B? Uh, yeah, I'm down for it. And unfortunately, the one I'm most interested in, we'll have to take a little peek at the video in order to give it a fair play. Uh, Dan Bernstein wrote, uh, seriously, the trailer for the new Brian Austin Green superhero movie, Cross, looks so horribly bad in the best possible way, could actually open an episode of Frame Rate. And he gives a link to a Blaster article. Now, if I remember correctly, Blaster is the blog put together by Sci-Fi, right? Right. It's Sci-Fi's independent uh, science fiction blog. So they, they don't just cover Sci-Fi. They cover the world of science fiction. Uh, they don't right. just cover the network as SIFI, uh, I'll call right. it, you know, for, for clarity's purposes. Uh, and, and they are fairly independent. They'll, they'll do reviews of, of Sci-Fi shows that aren't necessarily always glowing. Okay, but I that being in mind, a wholly owned subsidiary of sci-fi.com would be the last people I would think would be throwing stones asking, is Brian Austin Green's Cross the worst superhero film ever made? I mean, of all the people to be throwing stones, the sci-fi channel, home to, um, I mean, a number of... I, uh, I think they actually are in the best position yeah, to decide. They're <laughs> it's like, on the worst. We, we worst. thought we had made the worst <laughs> movie, and then we saw this. We have to say, they put us to shame. <laughs> I don't think it looks all that terrible. All right, let's take a look and see. Led. I like the R mm, uh, yeah. screen. If your grandfather had this, and his father before him, and now it's mine, let's, and it will one day be yours. The Stargate set. And with it, it comes unstoppable power. A man cursed to live forever. I can't die. You ever felt pain, Anna? I've dealt more than I've felt. I am going to kill everyone. And a criminal overlord yeah. are about to unleash a sinister power. Powered by the souls of the dead. Satan in a stick. That will destroy mankind. Earth's only hope is one man born to protect and his band of rebels. These are hot. Twist and toss and then boom. 
Let's get this party started! I was hoping you'd hey. say that! Not today, Tombstone. Not on my watch. I have a bad feeling about this. Okay, bad feeling's gone. Look out, bad guys. Fastball's in town. He had a green glow. Bullets didn't hurt him. That's Cross. I thought Cross was just a rumor. That's no rumor, young lady. That is a deadly vigilante. Cross. Wait till they get a load from my balls. Where are you going? Coming soon to you know, DVD. I don't think this is necessarily a bad movie as it is just a string of cliches. And yes. poor production value. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that really looks, uh, someone in the chat room mentioned it looks like it was done on iMovie, and I think that would be a, a compliment to that, that production quality. But I refuse to believe that Jake Busey would do a movie that was subpar. I you know I admire your faith. <laughs> no, I, look, I like Brian Austin You're, Green, actually. I think he was fantastic I like on Vinnie Terminator. Jones. I think Brian Austin Green really redeemed his uh, acting career with his uh, turn on Terminator, the Sarah Connor Chronicles. I thought he was really good on that. But the rest of the movie just looks, you know, I pre- think pretty sketchy. If you take this movie back in time and release it in 1972, oh, yeah. I think it would be a huge hit. Because most of those cliches hadn't been worn to death yet. It just looks Dude, like. I say you take this movie now and you put it out on sci fi on a Sunday night, and it's the greatest movie that sci fi has ever created. I, I'm, wait a minute! I'm, I'm not seeing this. Is is, T- is Tiffany or Deborah Gibson guesting in this? Uh, Without that, no, I don't know. They Are they, wait, is there a giant cloud of robotic bees? <laughs> okay, no, there's not robotic. But bees. I don't see how this this tops. Is there a really bad CG shark Siffy movie? Yeah, I'm I'm saying that it's a uh, okay. Your point is taken. <laughs> Unless there's a giant robotic bee shark hybrid with Tiffany, then right it's not worth it. Yeah. Yeah, well, I I think that's the last word on this edition of Frame Rate right there. Thank you, everybody, (laughs) uh, for watching. Glenn, thanks for uh, stopping by. It's great to have you along for the conversation. Let folks know what you're uh, doing or or where they can find you online. Yeah, hit me up on Twitter, Glenn Rubenstein. And, uh, yeah, hopefully I'll know soon what I'm working on next. (laughs) Brian Brushwood, uh, any last thoughts? Uh, Yeah, hit me up on the Twitters. Oh, you know what I did? I converted my Facebook page over to a public page. So now the floodgates are open. Head on over to Facebook.com slash Shwood, S-H-W-O-O-D. You can send us an email. Frameratesshow at gmail.com is the address. We do read them. In fact, Brian responds to a lot of them, too, so he's better than me. Uh, Watch us every week on twit.tv slash FR. We'll see you next time. Bye, guys. Bye, guys.